Bring in show music, please. Hi, I'm CNBC producer Katie Kramer. Today on Squawk Pod. Less than five months till Election Day. Bidenomics versus Trumponomics, part two. The former president's 2024 economic advisor, Steve Moore. Now give Biden credit. He's telling people these crazy things that he wants to do, like tax unrealized capital gains, which has never been done before in the history of this country. He spars with Jason Furman, who served as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama. I have no idea what Trump is trying to accomplish with a 10% tariff on every single import coming from every single country in the world. What exactly are we trying to do in terms of leverage? Sheila Bear, former head of the FDIC, says mega mergers aren't all bad. This is symptomatic of a broader policy initiative to attack corporate concentrations. In the banking sector, they're focusing on the wrong place. Plus, right wing wins in Europe. Roaring Kitty speaks. Activist Elliot Management versus Southwest. Elliot. Elliot. Bone home. And basketball phenom Caitlin Clark not heading to the Paris Olympics. This is basically like poking the sleeping giant. Okay, well, we'll this is going to motivate me. Yeah. This is going to bring me on. And, and, and she's done it before. It's Monday, June 10th, 2024. Squawk Pod begins right now. Stand Becky by in three, two, one. Cue it, please. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. We are live from the NASDAQ market side in Times Square. I'm Becky Quick, along with Joe Curtin and Andrew Ross Sorkin. And and yes, I was just thinking this is about as good as it gets, where you go outside, the birds are chirping, you can Mm -hmm. feel almost normal because it's not pitch dark. I can only welcome this decision, which is in line with the logic of the institutions of the Fifth Republic. We're ready for it. Together with others, we will build a bastion against the extremes from the left and from the right. We will stop them. Meantime, well, let's talk about the European Union's elections. Yesterday's results appear to leave mainstream pro-EU parties in power, but far-right nationalist parties performed pretty strongly in France. That prompted President Emmanuel Macron to dissolve parliament and call new elections. Stocks in Europe right now down uh, across the board, not hugely, but France off about 2% right now in the Italy, uh, 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 the Italian F- uh, F- FTSEMIB uh, is down about 1%. You read all about it, it's like, Man, this is no way to run. I, I was trying to cobble it all together to what it meant. It has to do with Parliament, but each but individual France country, the, the, the whole thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, you got things happening in, you know, in Italy that, that were significant, in Austria. It, so you've got the overall EU, but then you've got all the Spain individual and players. A, a, Spain and uh, Italy, they maintained kind of their party lines. It was France that was a big shocker, especially. Right. Well, Italy was really. already pretty far right. Yeah. And, and um, you know, there's a big fear of Marine Le Pen. Le Pen and calling a snap election. Normally, that galvanizes people that are worried about where she wants to go. And then they say, OK, we didn't really mean it. And then, right. you, and then you come back a little. Now, I don't I know what her, it means. Her party got twice as much in the EU election. I don't know what it means for Helmut Kohl and Francois Mitterrand. I don't know whether those guys are. Uh, I don't think they care. I don't think those guys are in trouble. Well, you don't know. They could be looking down on us. They're still talking to Joe Biden Look, off and on. Macron's move, he's able to do that because even if his party loses in parliament, it's not going to change his position. He'll still be the president. It just You know who really got massacred was the, uh, the Green parties across the board. And n- nobody's going to. In Germany. Net especially. zero anytime soon. This GameStop thing, what, what, how do we sum it up? I got nothing? Is that basically what he said? Uh, it, it's almost like the It was the, insanity. It was it's insanity. almost like the emperor. You watch? It's it almost insanity. like the emperor. You could see, oh my God, he's buck naked. Well, Morning it's, Kitty. It's also because, as you mentioned on Friday, Andrew, he got lawyered up. <laughs> so he did. Well, be pretty that, careful. but he also was just, they have clothes for him? He was acting like, oh, I mean, did you watch? It was just like watching a, a train What's he going to do? Of a situation. What's he going to do? Is he going to say, here's, what I've, here's why GameStop is fundamentally going to improve? He's got he, nothing. He's got he one tried. of those eight balls. He, he had his eight balls. What did that he say? Talk, he was talking what did it say when he, when he, he was looked at about it? His, he basically reiterated what he was saying three years ago. He was back on the same thing, but the first 
15 minutes were so insane that I think any kind of like semi-sane person was watching this thing. Well, what is going on here? He went in and, and people said he's going to come out a billionaire. And as it turned out, he lost a quarter of a billion dollars, essentially. Now, let's talk. Uh, check out the shares of GameStop. The stock plunged. I don't know if he ever had the quarter, the paper, paper profits, plunged by 40%, 40% on Friday after the company announced that sales dropped significantly in the first quarter. It said it was selling more stock. Investors weren't impressed by a live stream uh, by uh, Keith Gill, a.k.a. Roaring Kitty, who appeared on his YouTube channel for the first time since the meme stock craze of 2021. <laughs> he reiterated his previous investing thesis but offered little new reasoning beside behind his large stake they're in the transformation stage here and um what could they transform into you know what i mean there's a lot of question marks about that understandably so but essentially it becomes at this stage of that second part of the analysis this transformation part it becomes uh, a, a bet on the management and Gil said uh, he doesn't have any institutional backers and said the GameStop positions that he has shared are his only bets. Shares of GameStop were halted multiple times uh, during his stream. It's kind of like a Pied Piper uh, thing with, 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 a lot of, um, with a lot of followers. What does this mean for the regulators the or E-Trade? No, what does it mean oh. for people that were looking at Do it? It seems to me now they can say this is going yes. to take care of itself. It's I think like that's a, what they're probably saying. Solo operator. Huh? Solo operator. Yeah. It's like, you know, enough said. You, if, if you guys want to, you individual investors, you know, do, do what you want to do. But, but I also think guys. there are hedge funds and others who are just following this, thinking that they can sort of surf on top of these other, you know. Some of the retail and everything else, yeah. Which way? Well, at this point, I don't know. But I think there was a moment, obviously, last week where they thought they could surf on top of him on the way up. Really? Clearly. Even though they're the ones that he's trying to right. squeeze. Probably uh, different ones he's trying to squeeze. I don't think he's actually trying to squeeze. I, I'm not sure any of the theses we've had about this are, have anything are, are to do with happening anything. right now. What was the other thing? He had the eight ball, and there was something else I read that just seemed funny, that it was like, like bonkers, right? <laughs> Elliott Investment Management has Elliot. built Elliott has built a stake of nearly three billion dollars in Southwest Airlines. Plans to push for changes. Uh, reports say Elliott plans to engage with management, but no other uh, details were available. Southwest stock price has fallen by more than uh, half in the past three years. Phone home. Phone home. What year was that? 1980. Because half the people three, maybe half the people were talking to weren't born yet. Yep. So they're like. What are you talking What's about? wrong with these people? Right. All right. Okay. Welcome to our heads. Tesla shareholders vote Thursday on whether to reauthorize Elon Musk's pay package. Over the weekend, Norway's sovereign wealth fund said that it will vote against that pay package, citing concerns about the size of the award, its structure, and how it fails to mitigate key person risk. Tesla approved the $56 billion pay package back in 2008, so did the shareholders, but it was voided by a judge in January. Norway's fund owns about 1% of Tesla, worth about $8 billion at the end of last year. The fund voted against the pay package in 2018. So at least it's not one of those situations, Andrew, where they vote one way back in 2018 right. and then say, never mind. Yeah. Insti how, the, I guess the institutional versus retail is going to be an interesting question. It's huge too. retail. Yeah. 50, 50, 50 percent retail. So we'll see mm -hmm. what, what ultimately happens. I mean, if you focus on Twitter or, or Reddit, you'd think that the retail is voting for Elon. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. And, and we, we were joking about E.T., the movie. That may have been a long time ago, but Steven Spielberg is still relevant. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll see just how relevant, but he is very, uh, making the big oh, you're video. You're trying to bring this back to Biden. No, no, I I'm not bringing it back to him, but he is doing a big, we'll see. But I mean, he's still as visible, as probably more visible I think than he's he was. more, he's a bigger cultural icon now. Right, than exactly. As in, as so we're pro isn't it, uh, what, what did we say it was in the 80s? So 83, maybe. Yeah. 80, 82. 82. I'm thinking so 82. is that uh, 40, that might be 42 right. years or something. And that little kid has been in a bunch of movies with Leonardo DiCaprio. Cheese will be next. 
Coming up on Squawk Pod, we are gearing up for the presidential election. Yes, it's this year, and our candidates have two very different economic agendas. Trump's 2024 senior economic advisor, Steve Moore, joins us. The capital gains tax would go up in the United States to roughly the highest in the world, higher than China, higher than Russia, higher than Europe. Like, how in the the world is the United States going to compete with those high rates? And what awaits in a Trump part two, according to Democratic economist Jason Furman. You're talking about 200 times the scope of what the recent Biden tariffs were. For a typical family, you're talking an extra $1,700 of costs. And then you add that to the other inflationary parts of the agenda. This is Squawk Pod. You are watching Squawk Box right here on CNBC. I'm Becky Quick along with Joe Kernan and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Have we talked policy? We really don't with all the identity politics. Joining us now to debate the Trump economy and the Biden economy and and, uh, future plans. Stephen Moore is a senior economic advisor to the Trump 2024 uh, presidential campaign, the co-founder of the Committee to Unleash Prosperity. Also, former Council of Economic Advisors Chairman Jason Furman. He's an economics professor at Harvard's Kennedy uh, School of Government. And uh, wow, we're going to break some, <laughs> can break some new ground here, Steve. Uh, let's, if Trump were to regain the presidency, former President Trump, what are uh, some of the planks uh, of his plan? I'm seeing something about even uh, further uh, cuts for corporate taxes. Is, is that really I- I being considered? Hey, Joe, good to be with you and good to be with Jason as well. Look, I I think there's no question the top priority will be to make sure that those tax cuts that Art Laffer and I and Larry Kudlow and others helped put together for Trump. And, you know, we did it. There was a lot of controversy about whether it would work. And, you know, clearly it did. We had a boom in investment. We, by the way, I was just looking at these numbers, Joe, corporate tax revenues have have almost doubled since we cut the tax rate. I think there's a Laffer curve that says that kind of thing will happen. But then, you know, it's not just um, taxes. I I think there's no question we're going to have a very pro-American energy policy. We're going to head back to being energy independent again. We're going to drill for oil. We're going to use our clean coal. We're going to use our natural gas to lessen the impact uh, that countries like Iran and Russia and China have over the world economy. And then finally, you know, we want to get Americans back to work. We want policies that could actually help people get back into jobs and not just jobs, but jobs that pay well. You know, when you've got a problem, Joe, (laughs) a lot of families today, middle class families, are a hard time being able to afford to go to McDonald's, for goodness sakes. I mean, this has been uh, an agenda, a four year agenda that has really crushed middle class families. Jason, there there are uh, certain things that you probably wouldn't disagree with, uh, I guess, there. But I, I, uh, there are some things you'd probably like to push back on that, that Stephen just said. <laughs> it, it, w- what would be different uh, if uh, the president wins re-election? Yeah, I mean, Steve left out the biggest tax increase that Donald Trump is proposing. In fact, it's the only very explicitly worked out part of his platform that I'm aware of, which is a 10 percent tax on all imports and a 60% tax on everything coming from China. I was not a fan of the latest round of tariffs that President Biden proposed, but let's put some perspective on them. They were on $18 billion of imports. We import $4 trillion worth of stuff. So you're talking about 200 times the scope of what the recent Biden tariffs were. For a typical family, you're talking an extra $1,700 of costs. And then you add that to the other inflationary parts of the agenda. You have advisors to President Trump saying that he would fire Jay Powell within the first 100 days. Um, That would set up a massive, massive um, amount of uncertainty, court cases, and the like. Um, Let's say he doesn't fire him in the first 100 days. But he just tweets at him saying that he's worse enemy than President Xi, which is what he did um, the last time he was president. Um, One of the things that President Biden has done that I really respect has been to respect and strengthen um, the independence of the Fed, even while it was raising rates really rapidly. Um, What happens if that um, comes to an end? So I think there's a lot of peril here. A lot of it can be expressed, especially 
in terms of inflation and tax increases on middle class families. Jason, do you, uh, I think I asked you about the capital gains uh, increase and you really weren't that that anti capital gains that that uh, President Biden was talking about. And I don't. What about the taxing um, unrealized gains? Both of those, to to many people, those are both sort of anathema to any normal uh, uh, economic thinking. Do, do, you, um, do you are you, you go along with both of those ideas? I mean, they're both way better than any of the tariffs that we've just been talking about, Joe. But um, look, there's a lot of economic logic to taxing unrealized gains. Right now, one of the problems with the capital gains system is that it locks in your gains. It dissuades you from selling because you want to hold until later when you get a lower rate. Um, that is a proposal that applies to a relatively small slice of people. Um, you know, we could argue what the right rate of taxing capital income is, and I'm open to a variety of things. In fact, I'd like to reform the tax code so we had permanent expensing and got rid of the interest deduction, more incentives for business investment going forward. But, you know, we're going to need to raise revenue somehow. What about the tariff issue, Steve? Well, look, on the tariffs, uh, I, I worked with Trump and his, his first administration. We talked a lot about tariffs. It's interesting because, you know, when I've talked to Trump about this over the years, he's always said, Steve, I use tariffs as a weapon. And he does. And he's used it in my opinion. And I'm, by the way, I'm a free trade guy like Jason is. I don't like tariffs. But, you know, it is an absolute truth that Trump used the threat of tariffs highly effectively in his first term. It was the threat of tariffs that got the European na uh, nations to pay their NATO dues. It was the threat of tariffs on Mexico got, that got Mexico to help secure the border. Uh, it was standing head, you know, toe to toe with uh, President Xi and saying, look, I'm going to slap you with a 40 percent tariff unless you start playing by the rules and stop stealing our intellectual property. And you know what? All of those things worked. And it's really interesting, Joel, because if you look at the tariffs from that were implied by uh, Trump, versus the p tariffs that have applied to Biden. Biden actually has higher tariffs than Trump does. So come on, um, that, that isn't kind of a fair thing. Now, one other point. I mean, this capital gains issue that you brought up is incredibly important to investors. Most of the people watching the show watch it because you're investing your money or investing other people's money. This would be an economic cyanide uh, pill to the U.S. economy. He's talking about, and, and by the way, I'll give Biden credit. He's telling people these crazy things that he wants to do, like tax unrealized capital gains, which has never done, been done before in the history of this country. People would literally have to sell the farm to pay the taxes. And the capital gains tax would go up in the United States to roughly the highest in the world, higher than China, higher than Russia, higher than Europe. Like, how in, how in the world is the United States going to compete with those high rates? Hey, Steve, you, you also mentioned a report about what would have been added to GDP if a lot of the, yeah. the fossil fuel, uh, whether it's uh, executive yeah. orders, whatever you want to. I, I think that the people, the Democrats would say we've never been producing as much uh, oil. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know why they'd admit that, because that was supposedly yeah, what right. they, they, they didn't really want. Yeah. record production of oil and gas. But that has, in fact, it, that is what happened. Is that in spite of Biden? How could it have been even better? What do you say, 250, how much more would have been added to GDP? If, about, if, about, uh, about two, we would have about 200 to $250 billion of increased oil output over the last three and a half years if we just stuck with you know, a very pro-drilling policy. Now, you ask a good question. How is it that we're near an all-time record of oil production? Uh, well, as everyone knows, we had the shale revolution that, that caused incredible productivity improvements. But the point is, you know, when Trump was president, when he left office, we were energy independent. We were producing about 12 and a half million barrels a day. And at that time, the price of oil was only 50 or $60 a barrel. Today, the price of oil is closer to $70, $80 a barrel. So when, obviously, when the price goes up, you would, you would normally see a massive increase in supply. That hasn't happened under Biden. Why hasn't it happened? Because what was the first thing he did when he came into office? He killed the Keystone XL pipeline. Just a few uh, week or two ago, he took uh, uh, nearly a million acres of prime oil and gas line uh, land off of line in Alaska. I mean, I could go on and on and on with these things, 
But when you've got a president who says he wants to destroy an industry, and that's what Biden has said to the American people, I want to destroy the American oil and gas industry, that, that tells people don't invest in the industry. I can't think of any industry that would do better if uh, Trump wins than oil, gas, and coal, by the way. We should be producing more of our clean coal as well. What do you think, Jason? You know, first of all, let's talk about things like the so-called Inflation Reduction Act um, and the investments in clean energy. Those are investments that you, the big oil companies are out there defending because they're making a lot of clean investments as well. They're facing a lot of uncertainty in terms of those investments going forward if President Trump came back into office and fulfilled his promise to get rid of those subsidies for clean energy. That's one of the really important industries that we have in America right now. Second of all, Joe, you already went through it chapter and verse for the biggest oil producer in the world. We're a net oil exporter at this point in time. We basically are energy independent in that sense. Um, but you're never energy independent from global events. Events happen around the world and they're going to affect the price of oil here. That's true no matter how much oil um, we produce. You can never insulate yourself from um, the global price. I do want to go back to the tariffs because the main thing that President Trump tried to negotiate was an agreement that China would buy more of our exports. And they're not buying more of our exports. They didn't keep to that agreement when President Trump was in office. They haven't kept to that agreement when President Biden was in office. Moreover, I have no idea what Trump is trying to accomplish with a 10 percent tariff on every single import coming from every single country um, in the world. What exactly are we trying to do um, in terms of leverage? Um, the one thing that Steve uh, said that I agree with is that, um, yeah, I'm disappointed that President Biden kept that first round of Trump tariffs, right. which I think didn't work, added a little bit on top of them. But all of that is minuscule, one two hundredth what we're talking about yep. um, in a second Trump term. I don't know. St Jason, Stephen's backdrop. I don't know, man. Um, it just, when he's talking about things, I'm not even listening to what he's saying, but I'm looking at that backdrop. And then with yours, you got you to gotta get, get something like that, uh, Jason. It just, it just, did you see it? You know what I'm saying? It, it's better than the, remember when you were locked in that pod, one of those pods? I know, yeah. This is better than that, but look at, he's got the cap. I mean, it's just the gravitas. Uh, he's just I, waiting. He's just waiting to go in there and put those tariffs in. You can just see it happen. He's going to be in one of those offices back there. He's hoping. Uh, Jason, thank you. Stephen, let's do it again um, sometime. It, 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 you'll both come back and do it together again. You seem to like each other. Okay. It's nice to see. Absolutely. Thank okay, you. Great. Next on Squawk Pod, Sheila Baer joins us. She ran the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which protects account assets in U.S. banks, during the great financial crisis in 2008. And she says the proposed $35 billion Capital One Discover merger is a good thing. It's typically almost sacrilegious to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask you the question. <laughs> Do we have too many banks in this country? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think the market should drive those solutions. And the scandal, the once sleepy agency rife with complaints of harassment and discrimination pushing out the FDIC's current head. Morale is very bad at the FDIC. They need a fresh face. They need a fresh perspective. Uh, they need strong leadership. We'll be right back. You're listening to Squawk Pod from CNBC. Here's Andrew Ross Sorkin. Welcome back to Squawk Box. Uh, while regulators are discouraging regional banks from growing through acquisitions, our next guest writes in a Financial uh, Times op-ed that in order to compete with big banks like J.P. Morgan, just like Capital One Discover, could help boost regional bank competition. Joining us right now is Sheila Baer. She is the former FDIC chair and a systemic risk senior advisor. Good morning to you. And I will tell you, I was surprised to read this op-ed, Sheila, because... Historically, when we've talked about risk and we've talked about getting big and bigger and too big to fail, I've always thought you were on the other side of this, but this is a very interesting sort of twist. Well, I am very concerned about concentrations. We do have too much concentration in the banking industry, but it's the very, very top. It's the J.P. Morgan Chase's, it's the B of A's, those, those top four. And actually, J.P. Morgan Chase and B of A are starting to pull away from the other two, City and Wells, uh, to provide even more concentration. So that's where regulators should be focused impeding regional bank M&A. Uh, we have a lot of regional banks. It's uh, highly competitive. 
Uh, but they need scale to compete. And if you want a market-driven solution to some of this concentration, you need to let the regional banks get a bit bigger. Um, and also, it's also regional bank m and is, is important from a stability standpoint, especially when you get into right. times of stress. You know, the FDIC and other regulators have proactively worked with banks, weak banks to merge with stronger ones to help stabilize the right. system. So you're so kind sure. of taking that tool out of the it's, kid as well. It's yeah. typically almost sacrilegious to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask you the question. <laughs> Do we have too many banks in this country? I mean, we always talk about local banks yeah. and the value that those local banks have to their communities and how important that is. But there's right. a flip side argument to say, look at certain other countries that have only a handful of banks. Where should we be? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the market should drive those solutions and that we need to charter more banks too. We need to worry about regulatory complexity uh, I've been a strong advocate for strong capital regulation, liquidity regulation, as you know, but I think you can do that much more simply and less expensively from an administrative cost standpoint, which is also, you know, impair the ability of, of banks to start and grow because of these costs, which also benefit the larger banks. So I think that should be market driven. I think our system of multiple banks is more dynamic. It's more innovative. It's served us better uh, than these other countries where you have highly you know, huge concentrations and just a handful of small banks, or excuse me, of large banks, but Switzerland, you only got one now. <laughs> right. So that's a, that's a very precarious uh, position for the government to be in. So no, I, I think it's a good thing to have lots of banks. I think it's been a strength, not a weakness of our system. Do you think that the prevention, if you will, of more mergers and acquisitions in the banking space is a function of the Treasury Department? Um, do you think it's a function of the DOJ and FTC, I just interviewed uh, Jonathan Cantor and, and Lena Khan last week. I mean, you sort of have these competing interests. I, I could see yeah, a Treasury yeah. Department saying that maybe we should have more concentration. And I could see a Jonathan Cantor or Lena Khan saying maybe not. Yeah. Well, again, I think it's, it's where you're going to be focused. I, you know, broadly, I support the administration's focus on increased, uh, you know, corporate concentrations throughout our economy. And a lot of that's been driven by super low interest rates. So some of the higher interest rates are, they are going to be correcting for a bit of it. But if you are worried about concentrations in banking, and we should be, look at the top. <laughs> you know, to, to, to attack the regional bank m and is just going to increase the competitive mode around these very, very large institutions we have already. So that's where you should be focusing. Higher capital would be one way to do it for the mega banks. Basel III seems to be bogged down. I think there's going to be substantial revisions uh, before we see uh, what happens there. But if you want to reduce concentrations, focus at the very top, not the regional banking right. sector. The regional banking sector is not concentrated. Do you think there would be a distinction between how banks and, and bank mergers would be approached under a, a Biden administration versus a, a Trump administration? You know, I assume so. You know, it, Trump is so <laughs> predictable. Who, who knows uh, what would happen there? Uh, but I do think there is, yes, this is, this is symptomatic of a broader uh, uh, policy initiative to attack corporate concentrations. And again, some of that I'm sympathetic to, but they're, in the banking sector, they're focusing on the wrong place. The, the true right. concentration is at the very, very largest banks. Can I get you to weigh in on what has been written about in terms of a very toxic environment at the FDIC and uh, your your successor, or uh, multiple times later along the line, but um, right. yeah. his exit? Yeah, well, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's tragic. It's heartbreaking. Uh, I have said, I think it, it's, you know, this is hurting him. It's hurting the agency. Uh, it's time for him to exit. He said he will as soon as his successor is confirmed. Should he be out of so there, though, already? I mean, this idea that he's hanging around the hoop? Yeah. Well, I do. I, I know. I think morale is very bad at the FDIC. They need a fresh face. They need a fresh perspective. Uh, they need strong leadership, someone who understands the operational side of the it's a very complex agency, as well as on the policy side. But they need that. But if Marty goes now, you're going to have a split board. It's just going to be paralysis. And I don't I don't see how that's going to help uh, the agency or staff morale either. So I think the solution here is for the White House to act quickly to bring in new leadership. Now, it's a problem because the place is having a lot of problems right now, and there's going to be job uncertainty, right, because we don't know what's going to happen in the elections. And if Trump is elected, Mr. Trump's elected, you know, all bets are off in terms of respecting agency independence. He could just fire everybody. So I think that is impairing the, the, the White House search. 
tell them, but can we recruit you to as on a temporary basis? <laughs> what are you doing this summer? No. Are you available? No, right. Are you available just well, just that, for the next that, six yeah, months? We can just say it's a short a short term. You're coming in to clean things up, yeah. and then somebody else will take yeah. over, depending yeah. on what happens yeah. after the election. Well, I, that's very flattering. I, I don't think I'm the right person, but I, I do think that might be another alternative to look at a potential recess appointment. Bring somebody in who's strong on the operational side uh, to help start, pro, you know, uh, providing a fresh start. Uh, you know, the FDIC is a great agency. I really uh, it, get upset when I hear people say, oh, it's always been toxic. It's always been terrible. That is just not true. When I left the FDIC, we had a highly energized, highly professional, high, highly motivated agency. So what do you think happened then, Sheila? Again. What do you think happened to this I don't group? Is know. it really Marty? It, uh, no, because for years after I left, we, we continued. You know, I was on the outside looking in, but, you know, rankings and best places to work remained high. I think uh, there were tensions between him and Yelena McWilliams. I think that maybe was a distraction. Uh, and then, you know, things, part of the problem was that we were having these, apparently having these incidents widespread at the regional level that were bubbling up, but some of them were at the headquarters level too, but people weren't responding. They weren't imposing accountability and it, that kind of thing right. just starts spinning out of control. So you've got to be heads of these agencies. I know policy is fun, but you've got to pay attention to the administrative, the operational side as well, and make sure people are held to the highest standards in the FDAC and traditionally has and will, again, have very high standards of conduct. If, if now you, you have a candidate you'd like to, to nominate right here? Yeah, well, I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it publicly if I did. <clears throat> but I, I think that's the profile I think the White House should be looking for. And fingers crossed they're able to okay. bring in somebody uh, soon. Yeah. Sheila, we got to go. But I know what's right behind you. And I just think we should we should give you a, a promotion opportunity because, uh, you know, people don't know that Sheila writes kids books. And she's got them right behind her. So I don't know if I you do. want to tell us about uh, either Daisy Bubble or one of the others. Well, first. <laughs> thanks for the plug. Yeah, it's called Money Tales. There's a eight. Uh, there, there's the two most recent ones. One's about asset bubbles, and one's about uh, price inflation topical uh, topics. But yeah, I mean, I love it. I've been doing it since uh, my first book came out in 2004. Uh, and for since you're letting me do a little ad for Title I schools serving low-end communities, go on my website, moneytalesbooks.com. We've been able to raise money to make book donations. And if you can afford to buy them, happy for you to buy them, too. Yeah. But uh, it's been a labor of love. And I think uh, kids learn, but the parents learn, too, when they read the books with their it, kids. It, so it's a is, bit of self-education. Is speaking the language that children understand something that you learned in, in Washington? Or was it a very... <laughs> was it a was it a good well, skill it, to, to have? So to, making things very simple, especially very simple. sometimes with certain politicians. I won't. But, you know, my former boss, Bob Dole, when I was writing this, he tweeted that we should make. There's another one, another one called Billy the Borrowing Blue Footed Booby. It's about the the perils of unaffordable debt that every member of Congress should be reading that. So there you go. I These are complicated adults topics. Learn. What's the oh, but <laughs> real quick age, uh, age range for the books. Uh, seven to ten. Grades, seven to ten. grades two through five. That's perfect for the for Congress. That's, yeah. That is, that's, <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. And, and the Sorkin kids. Thank exactly. you very, very much, Jill. It's great to see you. Thank you. Great seeing you. Bye-bye now. USA Basketball won't include, this is so crazy to me, uh, Caitlin Clark in its 12-player roster for women's competition at the Paris Olympics this summer. Clark telling reporters she didn't feel any disappointment with what she viewed uh, and many viewed as a snub. She said she's excited for the girls on the team and will be rooting them on to win gold. When asked about the Olympic decision, the Indiana Fever uh, head coach said that Clark told her, hey coach, they woke a monster. Clark didn't need extra motivation on Friday. She scored 30 points in just 39 minutes of playing time against the Washington Mystics. That included a rookie record tying seven three-pointers. But can we just say, that it's totally nuts. I mean, it is nuts. If you're trying to build the, the franchise that is American basketball, I, I, can't even, I, I can't even rationalize in my head how you could ever get to this conclusion. She's, in, she's definitely in the top 12. I don't know if she is in the top five uh, yet. And, you know, her, her, the, the way you start and, and you watch the greatest college athletes in right. any of these sports when they go into 
whether it's the NFL or MLB or anything you go into, it takes some time. And she has not, she's not great yet in the W in NBA. She will be. But this so, is a snub. I know. This it is, probably this is. There's no other way to describe she's in, it. But no, she's in the top, to definitely in the top 12. Choose to do this. And if this but, is supposed to showcase American basketball, if but that's Andrew, what this is about. If it's about money and, and, and visibility, you're right. If it's about picking the, the, see, I say she's definitely in the top 12. I don't think she's in the top five. At this point, she's had yeah. a rougher entry in, but I think the bigger issue is the lack of her team's support in the situation where she got shoved right. down recently and nobody came to her. I've back. watched some ESPN, and, and these guys, they, they definitely call it exactly like it is, and we know what a lot of it is about. And, it's jealousy. And they, and they hearken back to Larry Bird. When Larry Bird came in, and you didn't know whether you liked Larry or Matt, and, they event, and there was initially yep. some tension between those guys. They became be- lifelong friends. But at the time, it was like, you know, Larry, it is a, a sport where, I mean, African American, or, you know, black people are great Basketball, and, and it's also he was new like people coming in. Right. And it's, it is, yeah. but it's is Kathy Engelbart, who runs the WNBA, and Adam Silver just going, "Oh my God, this is just know. one of the like, missed I, opportunities I mean, of life." I've been pulling for, but until this game on Friday, she's she has not scored as she many points. She hasn't been right. twelve points, Great. fifteen points, yet. seventeen points. And and when the, the, that foul, I, I could see it as a as a flagrant foul, it was a flagrant and, sort of foul. The, and a cheap shot. <laughs> and then again, the ball was out of play. I know, but it looked like there was a little. A little floppy, maybe, and and also welcome to the. Did you? It was, it was welcome. A welcome it was welcome, welcome to the, to the, the NBA. NBA. I don't was. immediately take it as. But a, it, it was welcome to the WNBA. It, exactly. And it was not an immediate response from her team, like where you'd go after them. Bill Maher, Maher said it right. Where with a guys team, you play hard against guys, but if somebody attacks a guy on your team, you all go after. I mean, them. I, that I, didn't happen here. I I really can see both sides because it. It's like she is she's why new. everybody's talking. She, she is why yeah. everybody's talking about it right, right. now. Yeah. But she can't sit there and, and just play by her. There are great players that were already there that maybe didn't get I as get much. It. Yeah. I yeah. get it. But and I just having and it's good for everybody. That's the thing. But I would be a little bit miffed if I had been well, I, I working like my ass said. off. This or, is basically like poking the sleeping giant. Okay, well, this we'll is going to motivate me. Yeah. This is going to bring me on. And 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 she's done it before. So You're, she probably is in the she's in the top twelve. You think? But that's that's a big statement to make about someone who just left Iowa to be right. in the top twelve. And a lot of people just want her there, but for you want money, you want people to show up, you want ratings on TV, put her in. But is that is she really as good as as the other twelve? Clearly, clearly the head coach doesn't think so. That's Squawk Pod for today. It's Monday. Thanks for kicking off your week with us. Squawk Box is hosted by Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Tune in weekday mornings on CNBC at 6 Eastern. And to get the smartest takes and analysis from our TV show, all three hours of it, right in your ears, follow Squawk Pod wherever you get your podcasts and listen anytime. That's it. We'll meet you right back here tomorrow. We are clear. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.